Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Setos. Uh, I'm Pete Moss. Uh, we will talk about VR, technical designs and tips for VR with Unity. So I'm an evangelist with Unity. Pete is the VR dude. VR dude. Technically speaking. Yeah. And uh, I come from Brazil. So I wanted to start the presentation with a couple of uh, really cool VR projects that are being done by Brazilian teams. So the first one is Pixel Rift, or Pixel Ripped, as the name changed for the Kickstarter project. So this was a very cool game where, so on this stage here, you have to play your game girl in, college, in school without the teacher noticing. So that's lots of fun. I suggest you guys check it out. So the next one is the, uh, the Angry Birds VR experience that was available in Rock in Rio, Las Vegas. And this was done by a very, very talented team uh, in Brazil. They're, they just announced their new game called Mono Wheels, I think. I, f I forgot the name. I'm trying to blank. But uh, so it's like a mono wheel racing, as the name implies. So it looks pretty good, too. And, and the third one is my favorite virtual reality experience of all times, which is Virtual Virtual Skee-Ball, which is just like playing Virtual Skee-Ball. So this will be presented at uh, <laughs> Unite in a, in a few hundred years from now, and the head of Carl Kalawert in a jar will be presented during the keynote. So let's get started with some of the VR best practices. Uh, show of hands, who is here, who here is working on a VR project right now? OK, a lot of people. Yeah. All right. It's good. It's good. So first of all, <laughs> the first rule of VR projects is frame rate is king. The second rule is frame rate is king. Mm -hmm. Frame rate is one of the main causes of uh, discomfort and dizziness on VR experiences. And if you ensure that your user, that your player, is not throwing up while he's playing your game, you're halfway there. And so, needless to say, uh, when, you, when you're making a VR project, you're not rendering the scene only once, like in a regular project on a PC or a console or on a mobile. So rendering takes a whole lot more time. So you have to be worried about performance. Once again, dropped frames are not worth better graphics because frame rate is king, right? So you don't have to focus on uh, amazing lifelike graphics, uh, as, we're gonna show, as we're going to show you on the next few slides, some examples of projects, you'll notice that uh, none of these projects is lifelike. You know, they're all uh, cartoony or you know, like, uh, alternate reality, stuff like that. And they're all amazing, very exciting experiences. Okay? So be very aware of performance. Be very aware of optimization. You know? Offer alternatives to your players. Uh, nobody, the project's not running on the same machine in every place, on the same device in every place. So offer quality levels, offer options to your players to ensure, once again, that the frame rate is stable. Okay? And use, overuse, abuse of Unity's, uh, of Unity's tools to ensure performance, like LOD, uh, culling, batching, and so on and so forth. So, and of course, last message of this slide, frame rate, frame rate is, is king. king. Uh, so this, this should go for every single project, not only VR projects, of course, optimize early, optimize often. Okay? So if you develop your project for a year without concerns of optimization, when you put it on your Oculus or your gear or whatever, it's going to run like five frames per second. And then you're going to have this crazy amount of effort on optimization alone, OK? So use single pass for rendering. This is not only for optimization, but also because this allows you to use anti-alias, which will help, uh, especially with far, away, uh, with far away objects on your game. They will not look like blocksy or like only one single pixel. And this will help your player to also keep the focus. Pete will talk more in detail about that. And so that's very helpful, too, OK? Maximize texture compressions. This is very important. Once again, don't aim for lifelike. Aim for something solid, something consistent, but which is pleasant and it's interesting and it's fun for a player because frame rate is king. Okay? 
every optimization will bring a benefit to you. If you can squeeze one millisecond of anything, this will be helpful for you. And of course, avoid any spikes in performance uh, on CPU with any mathematical functions. So for this, of course, Profiler is really, really helpful. Speaking a little bit about VR design, let's start with uh, input. So VR offers a uh, wide variety of input options. And let's talk a little bit more about each of those. So first one is mouse and keyboard. And it's funny because whenever you put headset on the player, and he looks for a few seconds like a zombie because it goes like this, just looking for the mouse, looking for the right keys. So mouse and keyboard input on, on VR, on my experience, it works, but it's eh, kind of weird, you know? It's, it's just not, just doesn't feel right, OK? Uh, game pads are a bit better, especially because your player is not wandering around, hitting real life objects that he can't see. But the issue with game pads is that, the main issue with game pads is that a jump is just one button away. And jumping is complicated on VR. Once again, when Pete talks about the weakest link of the VR chain, which is the sad sack of meats that are ourselves, <laughs> he, will, he will talk more about uh, jumping and sudden movements. Okay? So <coughs> touchpads, especially on Gear VR, where you have the touchpad on the, on the side of the device, that works well. Uh, of course, it also depends on implementation, but usually works pretty well. Uh, in my experience, the, my favorite input device is the motion sensing ones. So this gives you a liberty of movement, but you also need to be careful. We were talking about, uh, we're talking about uh, Minority Report yesterday, mm -hmm. right? So everybody, when Minority Report came out, everybody was just drooling about the input interface, right? The movement, and like this, and like this. And that looks awesome for five minutes. Try working nine to five, Monday to Friday, like this. You're, you're going to quit after a week of job, OK? And one device that is not shown here that's yield some pretty good results is the leap motion, especially because now you have, uh, you have this, uh, this fixture that you can attach to, the, to headsets where you just insert the leap motion, and you can get uh, hand movements in front of the, of the headset. I've seen some pretty cool demos that, uh, that use the leap motion. So yeah, that's another input to consider. Uh, OK, moving forward, uh, we talked about input. But I think the first question you guys should ask yourselves is, do I really need an input device? I mean, uh, when, you, when your player is using a headset, he already have a great set of input devices, which are his eyes and his neck. Uh, gaze cursor, which is, uh, so you look at, a, say, a button on your VR game. And if you look at that button for two or three seconds, if you fix your, your, if you fix your vision on the button for two or three seconds, it just clicks the button. That, that works pretty well, you know? Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, use your neck to explore the, the world. You know, you don't, do you really need a gamepad? Do you really need uh, do you really need a keyboard? Maybe, perhaps, only moving the head, your player will have uh, the exact same result with a better input, you know? And uh, the touchpad, as I said, it's one of my favorite input devices. And a little bit more about design. So this is something, once again, we'll be discussing before this presentation. Uh, if you're just starting with VR, uh, if this is your first project, we suggest that you develop a shorter experience, something like 5 to 20 minutes to make sure you get the hang of it. But that shouldn't be a rule, you know? Like, there are longer experiences now that, when well done, will not be a problem for the user, you know? You will be able to comfort comfortably play your game for four, five, six hours. But it's your first time, get the hang of it, see what works, see what doesn't work, and just do a shorter experience. So this point is really important, you know? Design from scratch instead of porting existing games. So this reminds me of uh, when mobile gaming was starting. And 
there were plenty of games, lots of games using Turbo Stick, right? But it was not always the best fit, you know? Dual sticks on, uh, dual sticks on mobile is complicated to get get right. So, and the developers were using dual, uh, dual sticks because it was just a simple port from a PC or a console game or style to mobile. And that, as I said, sometimes it doesn't work well. Maybe it's better to simply revamp entirely revamp your game, not only for input but for performance and quality issues as well. And remember that uh, devices like the Gear VR, which have no cables, allow for 360 degrees uh, movement by the user. I myself, yesterday, I was at the exhibition hall playing uh, Monster Adventure. And this is a game running on Gear VR. But I'm getting so used to use cable devices that I was, I was self-aware not to turn 360 degrees because of cables. But I, th that's me, you know, your players are not accustomed to that yet, so take advantage of devices like EVR. Talking about designing from scratch, I'm going to show you guys the first example of that, which is Temple Run. Of course, Temple Run was born as a mobile game, right? But when developed for VR, it was redesigned from scratch. So this is a screenshot from Temple Run. Sorry for the... Uh, potato quality. Uh, so Tempo Run on VR is a first-person game. And if you look behind, so if you turn your view behind you, you'll see the monster running after you. So this is one of the signals if you are in danger, if you should, say, run faster, avoid more obstacles. But you don't need to look behind to have that feeling. Because if you guys notice, when you're running forward, you can see the shadow of the monster in front of you, and that's as good as notice as looking behind. So this is something that doesn't uh, exist <clears throat> on the mobile version, and that was added for the VR version. That's a really nice touch. You know? So moving forward, let's talk about a little bit about UI. Uh, always keep in mind of putting the UI elements for your game uh, two or three meters away from the player. Uh, that's, you know, as a rule of thumb, we use one unit, one unit in Unity equals one meter. Uh, Pete's going to talk a little, when he's talking about humans, he's going to talk about uh, convergence and focus and why this matters. You know? uh, the UI should fit in the player's viewport. What does that mean? Imagine that you're making, like, a uh, uh, shooter on rails, okay, where your player just walks around automatically firing at enemies that show up on the screen. Imagine if, so this is my viewport. Imagine if my health and my ammo is like here in the world. So if I, if I need to check my ammo or my health, I need to do like this every time, like this. So that's, that's not going to work. When I check in my health, I'm going to die, right? Because I'm not seeing the enemies in front of me. One other important consideration, even when the game is paused or you're on a menu or whatever, your player must be able to look around. Once again, that's to avoid any discomforts, any sickness. Uh, when your neck moves around, your brain expects the image to move. So just keep that in mind. And one other important point. The image needs to be consistent for both eyes. Any subtle difference will be extremely noticeable and, once again, will cause discomfort. <clears throat> if player leaves your tracking volume, of course, you'll stop tracking. And if that happens, you need to inform the player some, some way that this happened, you know? Otherwise, once again, he'll start moving his head and, or moving like this, and nothing's going to happen, and this will generate discomfort. So just give him some visual cue, just fade out, uh, put some warning on the screen, anything both for positional tracking and head tracking, OK? And of course, if there is something that the player can do to correct this, just let him know as well. Uh, integrated UI. So what does that mean? Make sure that your UI is somehow integrated with the environment. It's that the UI should no longer be uh, 
a number on the top right corner or top left corner or whatever, you know? Uh, a very good example of this is Dead Space. So uh, whoever played Dead Space knows what I'm talking about. Who have not played Dead Space, you can notice that, so Dead Space UI is pretty amazing. So this is a screenshot from Dead Space. Dead Space, of course, is not a VR game, but it gets VR really good. Uh, so the number of bullets left on the player's weapon is shown like as, a, as a, a hologram on top of the weapon. I'm not sure if you guys can see that, but there's like a, a small number 10 on top of the weapon. Besides, this blue bar running on the back of the, of the character, that's his health. So every element is integrated with the character. So this is beautiful. You know, if you can do something like that on VR, that would be amazing. And for doing that, you should uh, use world space UI elements in Unity. I'm going to show very briefly how to create UI, uh, world space UI elements. And the third point is UI feedback is critical. You know? uh, your player needs to know, especially if you're using the gaze cursor, your player needs to know that the gaze cursor is aiming at a specific button. button. So you should do that with uh, visual cues and audio cues, just one slight click when the player changes buttons. You know? And when you're aiming at a button, just change its color, put a, put a border in it, whatever. Just let the player know which button is selected. Uh, so <clears throat> speaking about world space UI elements, so this is a, this is a, a Unity UI with three buttons. And this is either using uh, world space or overlay or whatever. So <clears throat> once you create your canvas, all you have to do is, on, on render mode, select world space. And immediately, these buttons become 3D objects, which you can uh, rotate and position whichever way you want. So this works much better uh, on, <clears throat> on, on VR than fixed uh, UI elements. Once again, on Monster Finder, the game that's available at, uh, at Exhibition Hall, uh, they did a pretty cool interface. So the game is like a Pokemon snap on VR. That alone should sell you guys into the game. Uh, so the UI, it's very simple, very elegant. You see the four corners of your camera viewport. And you see a timer and the number of pictures you have left. And when you move your view, this follows you, of course. But it follows you with a, with a spring effect. So it kind of goes smoothly, and then it just jumps back a little bit. You know? That's very useful, once again, to avoid any discomfort. Uh, moving forward, <clears throat> for 3D effects, you should not rely exclusively on the stereoscopic effect. There's plenty of ways in which you can achieve uh, the effect of depth using lightning, using texture, parallax. <clears throat> is as good as simply uh, relying on stereoscopic. So I'm sorry. Uh, and of course, these skills, if you're not using stereoscopic, should be consistent with the stereoscopic depth as well. Some examples of games uh, that use it really well. There you go. This is Romans, Romans, Romans 360, which is a VR port of a game called uh, Martian Romans. Romans for Mars. And one other cool thing about this game is that when we're talking about UI, you can see here at the bottom right of the screen, the little bottle with 75, that's the character's health. Once again, integrated UI into the world, you know, not, not just a random number, just stapled on the top left corner. Another good example, Omega Engine. So all the UI elements are in the, the ship's HUD. And so one other, a few other design considerations. So be mindful of bright images, especially in the border of the, of the, of border of the screen. That can trigger uh, convulsions, that there's some health issues involved in that. So just be mindful of that. Crosshairs should, should always be drawn in the depth of the object targeting. Once again, this is for convergence. This is to keep the player focus consistent to avoid <clears throat> discomfort or tiredness. Once again, Pete will go over that. One other cool thing 
for cursors that you can do in your game. So this is, this is Romans 360 again. And what it do is, so it uses the, uh, the, the visual click, but when the cursor moves, it leaves a trail to let the player know where exactly the cursor is at any given moment. As you can see, so to the right part of the screen, you can see the trail of the cursor. Okay, so that's, that's very interesting. Once again, letting the player know what's going on. Uh, unexpected vertical accelerations. When, when I mentioned jump, jump, of course, is a, is a vertical acceleration. Uh, this can trigger severe discomfort for the player, so be very mindful of that. Uh, prefer play to range whenever possible. <clears throat> and once again, as I said, the gear allow for, allows for 360 rotation of the body. So your player is likely to look at every single direction. So be mindful of that. Avoid, uh, <clears throat> avoid any effect slash defect that will uh, affect the player's uh, sense of, of immersion. Uh, one other detail, and once again, to avoid discomfort, to make the, the player feel more comfortable, this game, Titans of Space, and Pixel Rift do that as well, it draws a body. So if you look down, you'll see a body. I'm pretty sure that every single one of you that already had some VR experience, one of the first things you did was look down. There was nothing. And that is very, very weird, right? So if you have this reference of a body, that will help, you help your player feel uh, more comfortable. Uh, I think that slide there shouldn't be there. That might be a mistake. Yeah. So scaling, once again, as I said, both elements, the elements for both eyes should be on the same scale. If it's not, it's going to look weird, it's going to look blurry, and it, it will once again cause discomfort. And remember, your first goal is to avoid your player from throwing up. Your scene should look uh, full. I mean, it should look interesting. You know, it should have very, a lot of elements. And this, is, this in VR helps a lot in the, depth, in the immersion, you know. Having a nice populated scene, not necessarily full, but well populated, it helps a lot with the immersion. And most importantly, first person in VR is not the only way to go. I mean, we've seen like the Angry Birds experience. It's not first person. It works really well. And another game that works really, out, really, really well, it's not first person. It's a game called Off-Road Velociraptor Safari, and where you drive a Jeep in third, uh, in third person view. So be mindful of that. Once again, not every experience in VR should be, uh, should be a uh, first person experience. With that, I'll pass the word to Pete, which will talk about how humans work. <clears throat> yeah, humans. I'm not from your planet. I'm still getting used to humans myself, so I'm going to show you how I see it. Uh, humans are the, uh, the meat bag in the middle of all the headset, the hardware, and everything else that we're wearing. Um, you might think that, that they're not very important, but they actually are. It's all about... Uh, matching uh, the experiences to human. And I want to explain what humans are from my alien point of view. Uh, as I see it, humans are two offset cameras rigged with an independent motorized alignment system. They can turn their head to gain a greater field of view. Uh, they can look up and down. Uh, their eyes can work uh, in sync. They don't tend to look different directions. If they do, you might have a neurological problem. You should check that out. Uh, one of the things that's really important is uh, we talk a lot about what's the, what's the DPI on the screen that you're looking at or, or what's the field of view and how does that relate to what we're seeing. The way humans see things is not about uh, dots per inch. It's about pixels per degree. Uh, and the actual human resolution is about 60 by 60 pixels per degree. So, over the whole field of range uh, that we can view, that's a lot of p potential pixels. Uh, think about what the VR headsets are right, right now. They're 1080p or greater, a little bit greater, just a little bit right now. Uh, we still have a long ways to go. 12,600 by 600 resolution is, would be optimal. That means one pixel per one little 
pixel unit. I don't know what, if there's a name for that. So it's better to uh, think about pixels per degree for the devices instead of just raw pixel output. Of course, because of the warping that happens, you're not getting a one-to-one -one with the pixels anyway. In fact, there's a great number of pixels in VR rendering that aren't even rendered at all. There's also this idea of foveation. So as I look forward, I can see very crisply in the middle of my field of view, the stuff on the outside and, and around is blurrier. I can't resolve it quite as well. Um, the way we fill in this, this model, this world, as we move our eyes a lot, it's subconscious. You don't even realize you're doing it. You can't see it, in fact. If you look in the mirror and focus back and forth on your eyes, it looks like you're not moving your eyes, but you actually are. You literally cannot detect it. Uh, foveation is something that we may help in rendering in the future. It's something we need to know about, uh, especially as eye tracking uh, becomes a thing in VR. Uh, I'd also like to get away from this idea that humans think in frames per second. We don't. Hardware is in frames per second. That's how we built it. But that's not really what it's about, uh, especially because of the persistence of vision. Um, we don't, we need a high enough frame rate to maintain the illusion. What's the high enough frame rate? Um, currently, it's 90. It's pretty good. Next year, it's probably going to be 120. Maybe a year after that, it'll be 240. It's only going to accelerate. There will be some kind of happy medium, we find. But every time it's upped, we realize we need to go higher. Uh, last year, it was 60 or 75. Uh, clearly, that's not enough. Uh, so what else about ah, human hearing? There's two microphones. They're on the sides of the head. Fixed offset. Uh, they are aligned, of course, to the head. Uh, but they're not just for hearing, they're also for sensing other vibrations and other, other aspects of, of motion. Uh, one of the most important parts about sound, I'm a sound guy from way back, uh, everyone always focuses on is it left or is it right? Is it louder in that channel or that channel? That must be the direction it's coming from. But the actual way we hear uh, is looking at the time differences and the phase differences between the ears, and that, that's just as important as intensity for determining direction. There's also, of course, the cocktail party effect, which means all the background sounds, it all just kind of becomes one mass. You can pull elements out. Sometimes they fade back into the background. But the number of elements you can pull out is very small, like five or eight or something like that. You really can't focus on that. And that takes training even to get to that point. Uh, there's a party tonight. Go walk around. You should all go to the party, by the way. Uh, go walk around and from a distance, just see if you can focus in on one person's conversation. I do this all the time. I'm, I'm a notorious eavesdropper. I probably shouldn't have said that because now you're all going to be really nervous around me. Um, but focus in. Sometimes if you, if you can align the, the lip movement with the sound that you're hearing, you actually can pull that sound out and you can pay very close attention to it and then let it fade back in. There's also this sensation of low tones seem to come from below. Subwoofers are always on the ground that might reinforce that, I don't know. Uh, there's this idea that high tones are from above, from on high, as, as, as you will. Uh, that's not always the case. There are frequency bands that are, we're more sensitive to, um, i.e. the speech range. That's the thing we're most sensitive to. Everything outside of that is uh, nice, and we're looking for predators primarily. But the beauty of the year is it's not just about hearing and vibration. It's also about uh, being an accelerometer. It's, it's like the accelerometer in your phone. It can tell which way the gravity source is. For us on Earth, it's down. When I'm out cruising the galaxy, it could be any other direction. But uh, typically, we're used to the ground being down. If you mess with that, well, uh, it may not work for you. Uh, and the beauty is we can use that to our advantage. It could also be used against us. The other thing is we don't sense velocity. If you're running at a constant velocity, uh, Einstein said this, you may as well be sitting still. Uh, you, you really can't tell, but we can sense acceleration, and that's what we're sensing. When I can tell that gravity is down, I mean, I can feel it, the ground of my feet, I've got a brain, I know it's pulling me, I can feel the pressure, but beside that, I can feel in my ears the direction. It points to the gravity source. Uh, this is something we need to pay very, very close attention to. I just did a little demo uh, where we were yawing back and forth, and I was trying to stand still like this, and it was very, very challenging because all my visual system uh, was overriding my ears. So now that we've described humans in mechanical terms, 
let's talk about designing for humans and some of the things that you need to pay attention to. Humans get sick very easily, very weak meat bags. If the eyes and ears don't agree, nausea is a common occurrence. Um, I literally heard this the other day. I, I'm so excited by this. I want to I want to share it with you guys. Why do you get sick when the systems don't agree? Uh, what I heard, and it sounds pretty legit. Maybe you guys can can tell me if I'm wrong. Um, it's your body. It's your caveman body from way way back, and your eyes see one thing. Your ears are telling you something else. Maybe your your skin senses or whatever are, te are telling you a third thing. It's your body thinking, whoa, something's wrong, something's wrong, you're probably poisoned. It's time to throw up because <laughs> it's only going to get worse for you. And I'm going to protect the body, so I'm going to make you throw up right now. Of course, that's the thing we're trying to prevent in VR for the most part. Uh, so paying attention to that and, and working against uh, the old methods from way back millions of years ago. Um, so the things to do to that, uh, make sure you have a stable horizon. Uh, maintain head tracking. Uh, Jay mentioned that earlier. If, if you go into a non-track state, do something smart about it, fade it out. Or uh, if you have a menu pop up, don't lock your head to the menu. That will make people sick very quick. Uh, if, you, if reality doesn't match the virtual reality you're seeing, you are going to get sick. Of course, frame rate's always king. It's the most important rule right now. Frame rate is king. Once we nail that, we'll probably come up with another more, more important rule. But for now, stick with that. And of course, uh, down is always down. Use that to your advantage in your games. If you have a gravity source, try to put it below the player, and they'll be a lot more comfortable. Be careful with other G-forces. We may get to a point where we can do some really extreme stuff uh, playing with G-forces, but even in daily life, that's a very extreme thing. You don't tend to go into centrifuges or race cars down a track. Well, OK, some of us do, but it's still pretty rare. Uh, another thing about humans, they get scared, very, very scared meat bags. They are, uh, VR has incredibly high immersion, so it, it, it's easy to scare humans. Uh, it's easy to trigger phobias, claustrophobia, agoraphobia, things like that. Uh, so you have to be mindful of that. Uh, you be careful with pointy things, especially pointy things coming at your face. Uh, it freaks me out when someone's trying to poke at me with a fork. Even if in VR, I would also be a little nervous. Uh, also, we don't like being crushed. It's typically something we tend to avoid. Uh, it's not always possible, but in VR, it is possible to avoid it. So, you know, be careful with that. Also, things like spiders. I, I use spiders as an example here. Uh, I personally am very close to my spider friends, but not everyone is. Uh, the reactions that I've seen with people near spiders is, is by far one of the most extreme. You see it, you scream, and you run away. Well, not everyone does, but a lot of people do. Uh, it could be something else for, for a different person, uh, but be mindful of what you're, what you're throwing in. I love horror games and stuff. Not everyone does. Horror games in VR are terrifying. That's kind of why I like them. Other people will throw the headset across the room. So if you want to keep your equipment safe, be careful what you're doing. Uh, and if you have a uh, fear response coming up, you know you're going to trigger something. The old idea of the trigger warning. Uh, it's not a bad thing to actually to warn them, uh, set the tone of what's going to happen, uh, possibly start with the art in the game when they're buying the game, show them what, show them what they're going up against. But be careful. Uh, I did a talk last year at Unite, and the big takeaway for the press, hilariously enough, is VR will kill you. <laughs> well, what we said is someone's going to do a jump scare and try to be cute, and then someone will have a heart attack and die. But the takeaway, of course, is VR will kill you, eh, whatever. Um, but we do need to be mindful of that. I, I don't want to die in VR. If you die in VR, you die in real life. It's true. <laughs> Tell all your friends. It's totally true. Um, but you guys are trying to make a buck. You're trying to build cool uh, experiences for people. Try not to kill them, uh, unless, of course, your app is designed to kill. There may be a market for that, a very, very limited and dwindling market, though. Be careful. It's bad for monetization. It's really bad for monetization, yeah. <laughs> There's not much analytics you need, though, for that, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, he triggered, oh, he's dead. There's your analytics. So be careful with that um, as you move forward. Another thing, humans get really, really tired. I'm kind of tired right now. Oh, man, I was out too late. I'm just standing. I'm just standing around. That's probably the best thing we're, we, we can do. Uh, we're designed for that. 
Uh, but as far as moving our arms out, Jay was talking about this, the minority report idea. I want to take you eyes and slide it around and look cool like Tom Cruise. I'm pretty sure I didn't look cool doing that. Um, the thing is, holding your arms out like this and working like that looks awesome, so badass on film, terrible in real life. Uh, think about the Wii U, or the Wii Remote, rather. Uh, it was the coolest thing. You were going to go bowling, you were playing tennis, you were doing these cool things, and a month later, you were sitting on your couch doing that. That's all you wanted to do, um, because you're tired. You, you don't want to, you have to conserve your energy, you have to conserve your momentum. Um, so be careful about what you're doing, and that goes into UI design and all the other things that we've already talked about. Also, uh, be kind to the eyes. It is a little weird with the screen right here. You think you're focusing out there, but you're kind of focusing here too, and the mismatch can tire people out. Uh, be careful about what you're forcing players to look at. There's almost this three-zone idea that we're using in the VR development that we're doing at Unity. Uh, there's the, the immediate zone. That's the personal space. If someone was up in that space, you would be pushing them away from you. Uh, then there's the near zone. That's the you know, one to five meter area somewhere in there. Uh, that's the kind of area that you generally work with. That's arm's reach or just a little further maybe. I can, I can reach out and grab that. Everything beyond that is the far distance. The idea is to keep it in the more near area and keep things sized such that you can take them in all at one, in one view. It used to be said that uh, VR was best for the short experiences. We did say a moment ago to uh, kind of keep it short for your first development. But this is from the other point of view. How much VR can you take? Uh, so there used to be the wisdom that, yeah, five minutes tops. And with the earlier tech, that actually was true. Uh, now we're saying, okay, 30 minutes, an hour, that's not so bad. I'm, I'm weird. I like VR. I, I spend a lot of time in it. I'm, I'm moving in, actually. I'm, I'm moving my life over. I'm not there yet. Uh, the movers are coming on Sunday. Um, I, one of my favorite games, I, I, like every time I do this talk, I, I, I hype this game, but it's so badass. You guys got to try it. It's called Elite Dangerous. I've only ever played it in VR. It's so amazing. Uh, I had a couple of weeks off at Christmas time. I took a little extra time. I bought Elite Dangerous, a really, really nice Hotas joystick. Uh, I had a DK2, of course, and I pretty much spent 10 hours a day for two weeks in this game. It was the most extreme that I've done to date, uh, but I, kind of, I didn't feel weird coming out of it. I mean, you kind of got to get your VR legs uh, to not feel weird all the time, but uh, it's amazing how much time you can spend in a VR environment when it's done well, and those environments are only going to get better and better. So. This idea of five to 30 minutes was true earlier this year, last year, that sort of thing, but I can pretty much safely say that, that is, that's going to be, that's gonna, to be longer and longer. Humans like reality, but, but not really. We're, I mean, kind of, but not really. Uh, you can play with reality a lot. Um, the hyper-realistic graphics, this idea of generating real-looking humans actually it tends to creep you out more often than not. Uh, they call it the Uncanny Valley. You probably all heard about it and talked about it. Uh, I have this personal belief that we've actually got past the, the bottom part of the, of the valley and we're moving back up. We're getting closer to the other side. We're getting to the point where we're getting pretty damn good, but not quite there. But it's not good enough. It's still going to freak people out. Um, but it doesn't really matter too much, especially if you try to stay away from that far side. Um, the more important thing is to be, is it has to have a good feel and have consistency in, in, your, in your game, especially consistency of motion, uh, and that will allow people to just get immersed. Think about all the cartoons and stuff that we watch. It's not real. Powerpuff Girls don't exist. I wish. Sometimes they did. Uh, but in VR, they totally can, and you, your brain will believe it. Um, be careful with the unexpected. Um, that goes back into the fears and things like that. Um, sometimes doing the mind-bending reality ripping experiences while very cool and psychedelic at times. At least warn people what's going to happen. Um, establish a reality and be consistent with it is probably the most important thing for humans. Here's a great experience. Uh, I'm sure many of you have tried it by now. This is a job simulator from Alchemy Labs. Um, what does it look like? It kind of looks like a cartoon. Um, the hand is a big blocky hand. There's no arm extending from the glove, but that's okay. We, we buy it. It moves like our hand. 
It's, it's my hand. As far as I can tell, it's my hand. It looks different suddenly, but I'm cool with that. Um, there's a Sri Racha bottle floating in space. Seems like there ought to be another hand. It could be just clipped out. I can't tell from this image right now. Um, it's sort of like reality. It looks like a Sri Racha bottle, but it's not. It squirts particles out instead of actual things you can taste, but it looks like the stuff you could taste, so it's real enough. Uh, every slab of meat in this game is exactly the same, which is hilarious, especially when you make the meat sandwich because it's a giant slab of meat on bread. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter. It's not real, but it's real enough. We buy it. It's consistent. It moves well. That's the best part about that game. It's a physics playground, in my opinion. Come on, button. And this is uh, the Finding Monsters game. This is the game that... Uh, Jay was talking about, they have it on the Gear VR, it's in the Expo Hall. I haven't personally played this game, uh, but this is another one. Look at, look at this cartoon world. Um, it's not real, it's totally not real. The ground, the ground is stitched together. I've never seen that in real life. That mushroom thing, tree thing over on the side is also sewn up. I have a seven-year-old, he has toys that look like that, but I've never walked through the forest and seen that. But again, I don't care. Uh, it's good enough, it's consistent enough, it's real enough. I'm in, let's do it. Humans like to be grounded. They like to, the ground isn't necessarily always the ground, it's, it could be other elements. Uh, audio cues can be really important. We like to know if we put an object over there that it's still over there. Uh, if you saw the HoloLens demo yesterday, HoloLens is very much about that. I put an object in space, I can walk away, I can go to work, come home. Been gone eight hours, oh hey, I left this thing running, it's right here. It's still running, it's been there all day. Uh, that's kind of where things are going. Um, you wanna look down, you wanna see a body. Doing bodies in VR is a little tricky still. Uh, mapping and everything is not quite there yet. We're getting there, we got some ideas as an industry. I'm not saying I personally have any great ideas there. I'm mostly trying to get other people to work it out so I can just play cool games. We'll get there. Uh, IK tracking, things like that, connect tracking, uh, I think are, are great steps forward, but we still have a long way to go. Um, another thing to do is uh, give people a path. Show them where they're gonna go, especially if they're kind of flying through a level, uh, they're not, they don't have a body, they don't know. Give them a, a visual clue of where they're going and it's a lot less objectionable. Uh, and most importantly, especially when you're trying to build out your world or possibly port something from another system into a VR system. Be careful of what you're faking in the background. Last thing you, it's like, uh, it's like you're at the movie. Or, or, ooh, actually that space ball scene, you know, where they're fighting and they're fighting, it's a good time, and then the guy swings too wide and he kills the gaffer who's just off of the frame. Like there, there might, in the movie, be people behind you, but the reality of the movie is there's no one else in that room. And in VR, you don't have the luxury of having a fixed frame. You don't want to see the crew. You don't want to turn around and go, are you the game developer? Did you write this? Um, you don't want to turn around and see gaps in the world and see through walls and into other things. Things that we do for tricks to keep performance good. Um, we got to be careful with that. We got to make a consistent world. No seams, no leaks, no light creeping through. It sounds easy, but actually that level of polish is challenging. Uh, it takes time. It's that whole famous the last 20% takes 80% of the time. It's that level of polish. It's easy to rough out a world, but to make it totally consistent from every point of view, it's a challenge. It takes time. Humans can empathize, especially in VR, empathy can be really, really high. We can play with scale, make things really, really small, and we can be like Godzilla crushing the world, and then in a moment, we can shrink down and just be a little ant on the ground underneath Godzilla's foot. Uh, it really changes the feel, it changes the, the overall experience. Uh, and uh, even things like UI can make you feel like the menu is way too big. Oh, it's so huge. You gotta be careful with all these design elements because humans feel it in a, in a different way. It's not just about what it looks like, it's about what it feels like. It always comes down to what it feels like. If it feels awesome, then it is awesome. Okay, uh, that's the design bit for humans. Um, soon I will return to my planet, but for now, this is uh, what I've seen. But for now, I'd like to talk about the future, where we're going and Unity and, and this VR stuff that we're working on. Uh, a lot of people think I'm like the head of the VR program. I'm just the guy who likes to talk about VR a lot and travel. 
Uh, there are way smarter people than me working on this behind the scenes. I work closely with them to try to feedback what I get from the field. I go back and I, I show and I tell and I make connections where connections need to happen. Uh, so I got a few dreams and a lot of this is kind of biased to me, to me. So I'm gonna, I'll just state that clearly. This isn't necessarily where things are going, but these are some things that I would like to see happen in Unity for VR. Uh, audio, uh, all my trainings in audio, I actually have two degrees in music composition. Um, I dropped out of my PhD. I always wanted to be a college dropout. Highly recommend it, it's pretty cool. Um, so audio is a really important thing, and it's something that we have neglected heavily. Uh, it's getting better. It's actually getting better. Uh, now in uh, Unity, we have HRTF support uh, as part of the audio system. That's great. We still have more that we need to grow in that area. Uh, but there's also plugins, Spatializer plugins. Oculus has got one. Uh, there's the Y stuff, FMOD stuff. Everyone's trying their own different version of it. Uh, Visisonics, I, I saw them. If you guys are here, go woo. Oh, man, come on. <laughs> well, anyway, those guys got a really nice uh, HRTF system. Uh, I got a demo of it in the expo hall yesterday. Um, this idea from way back is that all you need is the amplitude stuff to tell you where things are. That's actually bullshit. It's wrong. It's been wrong. Hollywood has been lying to you for years. They say 5.1 audio is enough. It's not. It's not real. It's not applicable to games, in my opinion. It's definitely not applicable to VR. Um, there are other formats. Ambisonics is really cool. I'm a big fan of that myself. It's a four-channel format for storing audio. It stores all the phase differences. It basically stores audio vectors, if you will. And the cool thing is it can be decoded to any number of speakers. It's always four channels. Always, always, always. You can actually do three channels if you don't care about height. Uh, it's a WXYZ signal. You can decode it for whatever. That means you can decode it for headphones, too, and do HRTF. You could decode it for a room where the sound rotates with your head. Because we have head tracking, it's pretty good. We can also track the sound to your head in a room. Um, so there might be some interesting options coming down the line. I'm not saying Unity is going to support these, but uh, I'll, I'll nudge things along as much as I'm able to. I'm not very good at clicking. There we go. Another thing we want to do is we want to have all the HMDs. We're Unity. Come on. It's in the name. We got to do one thing and do it across all of the stuff. So we've got the Oculus uh, Rift. Uh, we got the Gear VR. Uh, Sony Morpheus, I should have edited this. They renamed it. It's the Sony uh, uh, Play PlayStation, PlayStation VR. VR. Um, Morpheus is a cooler title. Sony guys, if you're here, you can roll it back. It's way cooler. Um, we've also been working with HoloLens. Uh, the support is really getting pretty good, but it's still Alpha, pre-alpha, it's going to be a while before that stuff's all baked. Those guys are still working really hard on the product. But those are the directions we're going, but we're also talking to other companies. We're talking to the people with OpenVR, the Vive, that's, that's Valve. They're cool. They're all blocked from my office. Totally cool guys. Uh, we talked to the guys from OSVR. Uh, I think that they got a really cool system. They're building up to, to DIY VR. I think that's really cool because it's the DIY community that has made VR possible. So to support that community further and allow more exploration, just because Oculus thinks they've got the solution or Valve thinks they have the solution, HTC, whatever, that doesn't mean that they're right. They have a solution, but there is no the solution. So something like OSVR, I think, will allow more exploration and make it easier for people to experiment without you know, losing all of their budget. Uh, we are going to approach all of them. We want all the HMDs. We want to make it as easy as possible for you guys to develop Unity content for whatever headset is running. If we do it under the native integration, it should just work. What, you, you don't need to have 10 different SKUs for 10 different devices. You just have one application that should run on everything, just kind of like we do things. <laughs> I agree. I totally agree. Um, I'm, that one I'm pretty sure we're going to do. Like That's not speculative. Uh, inputs, uh, getting different input, that's actually a really big challenge. It's being solved right now in a lot of different ways. Some are better than others. Um, even the better ones have their limitations. So there's a ton of information and research that needs to, to come out uh, to make that better. Um, Oculus Touch is coming out soon. Uh, I haven't had a chance to try it myself. I'm really looking forward to it. I, I have a, a HTC Vive kit at the office. Um, that one's pretty cool. It's got the little wands. It's not exactly real, but humans are tool users. 
this clicker has been in my hand this whole time, and all I'm trying to do is keep my thumb on the button to keep going forward. I'm not thinking about the clicker. It's the same thing in VR. Once you get used to the controls, you don't think about the controls. Your screwdriver isn't something you think about when you're driving the screw. You're thinking about the screw because the tool is now an extension of your body. Your brain actually maps it as an extension of your arm. As far as your body and brain are concerned, it's part of you now. It's going to be the same thing in VR. Very, very powerful. Uh, but as far as the tracking goes, there's other things I'd like to see tracked. Keyboard, I, honestly, I think that'd be cool. It's an idea I had. I, I, okay, I'm sure everyone else has had that idea as well. Uh, but you know, put a little tracker on your keyboard. Make a little virtual model in your scene. Whenever you press keys, make that key light up and depress. You, all of this tech exists. We could make it happen. I'd just like to see a solution where I can walk around with my keyboard. I, I literally have a wireless keyboard and I walk around with it. It's kind of weird. Uh, maybe not everyone does that, but I do. Uh, I'd also like to be able to track feet. It won't solve all the avatar problems, but as I'm walking around, I'd like to be able to look down and get a pretty good sense that my avatar is doing the same thing. It doesn't have to be exact. It's just got to be pretty close. Maybe next year it has to be exact, but for this year, it's just got to be close. And I think we, we could get there. We also have the ability with other systems, the Virtual Somni I list here, um, the uh, Virzoom bike uh, is here, you should try it. Uh, these are other ways to kind of add immersion with movements uh, as an input device. Uh, they're all very, very powerful. Uh, rendering, it's getting better. It's getting better all the time. Um, but there's still a ways to go, especially for VR. We've done some uh, low-hanging performance improvements for shadows and calling and, and all of that to, to reduce the workload. We don't want to double the workload because you're rendering two eyes now. Most of that's shared. The eyes look the same direction. They don't look different directions. So there's a lot of duplicate information. Uh, we're trying to take advantage of that. MSAA is very important. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work with deferred rendering. I'm a big fan of deferred rendering, but it's kind of rough in VR because MSAA is, is gone. That means stuff in the background in the far distance looks very blocky and pixely. You can't read it. It's hard to make out what it is. It, it actually takes you out of the experience because your brain switches modes and it's like, what? What is that? Uh, and that's not exactly what you're looking for. So the MSAA does, it doesn't solve all your problems, but it makes it easier for people to stay in and not ask that question of what that thing is. They can just kind of accept it for what it is. It doesn't take them out of the world. Uh, full screen effects, actually we're getting better. My team, the Creative Content Studio, which I just hired a guy named uh, Andrew for the team, and uh, he built a, a DOF effect that actually works really well and is super fast. Uh, kind of mind-blowing. Uh, we're doing it for a special project right now, but uh, my goal will be to push that out to the public and just kind of give it away. It, it's a compute shader solution, super fast, and actually I think it could work really well in VR. Now we just got to add eye tracking so we know what to focus on, but there's, you know, it's another piece of the puzzle. Um, we do have some uh, better VR support in the profiler. We got to add a lot more. Uh, also, multi-GPU support, uh, SLI, things like that. NVIDIA is working on this problem. Uh, AMD is working on this problem. We're working on this problem. Everyone is working on this problem. It's cool for the manufacturers because, hey, you got two eyes. You, you need two video cards, right? OK, sometimes you do. Not always. And sometimes it's a sales gimmick. Sometimes you literally need the power. It's up to you to determine what your needs are. Uh, but we should have support for all of that so that your, all the needs can be met. Let's talk really quickly about the VR integration. Uh, Unity 5.1 is when we added the first level of uh, the VR integration, the famous checkbox, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, all you have to do is turn on the checkbox. I did it on the keynote. Many of you probably saw that. It, it literally can be that simple. Sometimes you have to add to it. You have to add a script to, to handle special cases, but it, it's not very difficult. Um, the idea is that if that checkbox is checked, and you run your app, it will look for any devices we recognize, and we'll run on that device and do the right thing. If it can't find any devices, then it falls back to mono mode, good old school, I'm looking on a flat screen, let's play a game mode. Uh, here's some of the platforms that we are working with and support. Uh, Oculus Rift, uh, obviously, is our, our first, and that includes the Gear VR. Uh, PlayStation VR, I did edit this screen, that's good, I remembered. Um, we have that as well, we've announced that. HoloLens is, uh, it's working, it's, it's, it's gonna be some development time. It's not gonna feed into the exact same system right away, but we still got some time. They're still working on the hardware. There's no real rush there. Uh, we're just trying to help them build out their system and, and do the right thing. Uh, I mentioned Vuforia here. 
because V4 is probably the number one plugin that people use uh, from the App Store, uh, Asset Store rather. And um, it's, so it's still very, very popular. So it's not a platform, but it kind of is a little bit for a lot of people. It's a very important piece of their tool. Uh, and then, of course, there are other systems, Steam VR. Uh, we're talking with those guys, but uh, for now, they got an excellent plugin. In fact, I think their plugin is the best VR plugin I've used. We've learned a lot from it, and some of the changes we've made internally in Unity are inspired from what we saw the guys at Valve doing with that. Uh, so I want to see all that stuff be pushed forward and get better. Uh, here's the checkbox. Um, I don't have a pointer, but I'll let you guys read. Here's a whole bunch of checkboxes in a column. The very bottom one is virtual reality supported. Check that box. It's in player settings. Very easy to find. Oh, here's the performance gains. So here's what we're doing right now. We're sharing shadow information. Uh, occlusion calling, frustum calling. Uh, we kind of have a big fat frustum that covers both eyes for that. Uh, but we have other optimizations that we're working towards right now. Uh, they're not all there. Uh, some of them are very speculative. We, we like to play and test a lot. Uh, when it's done, we release it. It may not be on the schedule people like, but we want it to be right uh, when it comes out of the gate. So there will be other upcoming optimizations, but it's not really worth talking about right now because we're still playing. Uh, some of the nice things about the VR integration, uh, this whole direct to Rift DXE, it's been really confusing and annoying for people. Uh, that's actually built in now. It does do direct mode. It just works. You don't have to think about it. Uh, what it does is it uses the drivers that you have on disk. You don't have to drop a plug-in in. It just finds the runtime and talks to it directly. Um, and the beauty is you don't have to update your game every time someone has a new SDK. You, yeah, you're still going to have to do game updates. Like, that's never going to go away. Stuff is always advancing. But you don't have to keep in sync with every single update. You just make sure you test it and it works. We, of course, have the uh, editor preview. So in the game screen, uh, in the game tab, you see what the headset sees, but just one eye. You see the left eye. And we actually have that working on the desktop now. So when you run a VR game, it will play in the headset for the VR user. But everyone else who wants to see what's going on, they don't have to look at this unwarped image. They look at the, uh, the, basically what the uncorrected or unwarped left eye is seeing. I'm on now. I'm going to go through real quick because I, I talk too much and I see the time's running out. But uh, the scripting API, you guys can see this in the docs. There is a new namespace, unityengine.vr. Uh, here's the classes that are in there, classes and enums. Uh, the VR device is, is basically a model of what device. It tells you what you're talking to. You can get information from it. Um, I see a few cameras up, so I'll wait one more second before I go forward. Oh, too late. Um, input tracking is another one. Uh, we track things based on nodes. Uh, what, what, what are these nodes? We'll show in a moment, but we can get positions, rotations, allow you to recenter, do things like that. Uh, settings is uh, kind of the big checkbox, like that checkbox in the UI is really settings.enabled. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, so you can set that in code uh, and get other information and play with stuff. Uh, VR device type, uh, what are the device types? Well, here's what we have for now. Uh, that enum is only going to grow. Uh, you'll be able to get a lot of information and make smart decisions based on what people are using. Uh, here's the nodes, left eye, right eye, head, center eye. We used to call that the bindi, the bindi cam. Um, so uh, well, I did, not, not, not we, but uh, anyway, gives you an idea. Come on now. Uh, targeting multiple platforms, just switch the build quality settings. That's really what it comes down to. All these stats are actually way out of date, so don't pay too much attention there. Uh, I should probably delete this slide. It's, it really doesn't make much sense anymore. But the idea is that if you're building for Android and you got the VR checkbox worked, there's your Gear VR. I mean, there may be other Android systems that do that and will support those, but for now, that's Gear VR. Switch your scene to desktop. Checkbox is still checked for VR. Now you're building for Oculus or some other HMD on, uh, on a PC. And that's it. Thank you very much.